Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It was in another garden where everything was perfect that Satan came to Adam and Eve, slipped poisonous words into their minds using his lying, forked serpent's tongue. That temptation and the sin that followed ruined everything. Death began to seep into all of God's creation that had up to that point been totally perfect and without pain or suffering or sadness or death. But now flowers began to wither, animals lost their tameness, fruit began to rot while it was hanging on the trees, insects began biting and stinging. Adam and Eve went into hiding from God, whose visits up to that time they had always looked forward to with such eagerness. And then they began aging. They began laboring and sweating and suffering and dying. And the Bible tells us that Adam and Eve lived a long, long time, hundreds of years after they fell into sin. But eventually, they did die and their bodies decayed, turning back into dust from which they were formed, as God had warned them they would if they disobeyed him and sinned. But their sin brought an even worse fate than just their own death and decay. So they wanted to talk to Satan and to listen to Satan. Well, by their rebellion against God, by doing just that, they and all their descendants earned the tragic right to do just that in an eternity of suffering in hell. But in our reading today from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, we see some events taking place in another garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. Now just a, a few days before the events of this reading, Jesus had ridden triumphantly into Jerusalem on a donkey, greeted by cheering crowds who, who acclaimed him as the Son of David. They recognized that he was the Messiah that God had promised. And as Jesus made that triumphal entry into Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday, he rode right past this Garden of Gethsemane, where now on Maundy Thursday he was praying in great agony. There, in that garden, the Son of God himself would begin to undo that hellish work that Satan had done thousands of years before in that other garden when he led Adam and Eve into sin. In Psalm 40 that we just sang this morning in our worship, which is a messianic psalm, the Son of God, before he was born as Jesus, prophesied about himself, saying, Here I am, I have come, it is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. Well, today Jesus speaks to us from that garden across all of the centuries that have intervened. And he tells us three words of truth to sharpen our spiritual focus during this Lenten season as we journey with him to the cross of Calvary. He tells his disciples and he tells us to watch and pray. He calls us to watch him, our Savior, faithfully doing the will of God for us. And then he calls us to pray for God's will also to be done in us and for us and through us. There have been some examples in the history of the world of great tragedies that have been caused by very small things. Think about, if, if you remember or if you've learned about from history books, the great tragedy and disaster of the explosion of the space, space shuttle Challenger in 1986. How that whole space shuttle and all those astronauts on board were totally destroyed by the failure of just a small piece of equipment, an O-ring somewhere in the system that had failed and caused the explosion. Or think of how the, the great wildfires out west, or even the, the fire that raged here in Chicago a long time ago, were all started by a small spark or flame that spread and grew and caused great destruction. Also in the Garden of Eden, 
It seemed to be such a small thing, a little choice that the devil was offering to Eve and to Adam. But it was a deep, profound, and a wickedly genius temptation. What Satan was after was to totally corrupt the human race. Look at you, he said to Adam and Eve. You are the crown of God's creation. You're even above me and the, all the other angels. But don't you think that God should treat you as more of an equal than he does right now? Right now, he's, he's just treating you as a servant because he doesn't think you are worthy to know everything that he knows. But I know a way to make that happen for you, to bring you an equal status with God. Well, ever since then, ever since that fall into sin, our human will has been in a relentless battle with God's will because our will has been totally corrupted by sin. Just think how often in, in our daily lives, in our minds, we use the I, me, my, mine pronouns. We talk about my life and what I want. In our world, we hear people say all the time that I want to be who I am. I have my rights. I have the right to be me. Well, that inborn self-centeredness touches every aspect of our sinful lives. It corrupts every aspect of my life. What Satan did in that first garden was to teach us to defiantly say to God, No, my will be done. My will be done. And you have to accept me, God, on my terms. Now, we're born this way, totally opposed to God. Even two-year-olds, even two-month-olds know how to do this. What Satan didn't tell Eve when he was tempting her was that this very kind of defiance was the thing that led him to be thrown out of heaven and all the other angels who rebelled with him to be thrown into hell and to be totally cut off from the love and blessings of God. But look, here we see Jesus. Jesus, whom the Bible calls the second Adam. The Bible tells us that Adam's sin led the whole world into sin and that death came to all people as a result of their sin. But Jesus, in contrast, came to do everything right to make up for where Adam had failed. He came to do that for all people in order to rescue us from eternal death, instead promising us eternal life with God in the joys of heaven. And so when it came to that time of testing from the devil, Jesus didn't fail as Adam and Eve had. But watch what it is going to cost Jesus to do that. We see him taking his three closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, with him and telling them to watch with him. To watch and to try to understand what is going on as Jesus is engaged in this cosmic struggle. Those three disciples had been together with Jesus as he had raised the little girl from the dead. And they had stood with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration to see a glimpse of his glory and majesty as God. Rather, Jesus now calls them, instead of continuing in that glory and majesty at this time, to follow him, to learn from Jesus what it means to be humble and obedient to the will of God, as he was willing even to suffer the scorn and the shame and the agony of death on the cross. He was willing to do that in order to pay for the sins of the world. As we look at the history of the early Christian church from those, those early centuries after Jesus rose from the dead and then ascended into heaven, we see many stories of martyrs, Christian believers who were willing to go to their deaths to be condemned to die for their faith rather than to deny their Lord and Savior, Jesus. And so often as they were marched off to their deaths, whether it was uh, by being tortured and burned or being thrown to wild animals in the, in the arena, they would go with joy on their faces, singing hymns of praise to God and, and praying to God. They knew that they were going 
to heaven. They knew that their death was not the end for them, but that it was just the beginning of their eternal life forever with God in heaven. The Romans and and others who were persecuting them simply didn't understand how they could be so joyful as they were facing imminent torture and death. But we might wonder then, why doesn't Jesus face his own death in that same way as those early Christian martyrs did? The text says that Jesus fell with his face to the ground. His spiritual anguish was so great that he could hardly even stand up under the weight of all of the spiritual agony that he was suffering. He knew that this was not going to be an ordinary death. His father had asked him to drink the cup of judgment, a cup filled with the most vile and putrid and reeking substance there is, because that is what sin is like to God. Jesus was covered with it, and he experienced God's full wrath. And as a true human being, Jesus' knees buckled at just the very thought of experiencing that spiritual anguish of being totally cut off from the love of God the Father. But watch what he says. Even in the midst of his anguish, even in the midst of his apprehension at facing that agony and torture, he still says, yet not as I will, but as you will. The tempter, the devil, had come to a garden again to try his old trick of warping the will of the one he tempted. But here, facing Jesus, he lost. The son's will remained in harmony with the father's will, and he would follow through on that divine plan that he set about when he willingly gave up the use of his power and glory as God to be born as a human being and to live among sinful people in this world. Thanks be to God for that grace and mercy of Jesus and his faithfulness to that plan of salvation. Yet as Jesus returned to his disciples where he had left them to watch and to pray there in the Garden of Gethsemane, what a contrast we see between his example in prayer and what they did. They were sleeping when he returned. Imagine that as we read in the Passion History reading just hours before these events, Peter had said multiple times that he would never forsake Jesus, that he would be willing to die rather than to forsake Jesus. And all the other disciples said the same thing. And when Jesus warned him that that very night he would deny Jesus three times, Peter protested vehemently, saying he would never do such a thing. And just a few months before this day, we also see that James and John had confidently told Jesus That, yes, they could undergo the same baptism of suffering and torture that Jesus was about to undergo as they asked him for the privilege of sitting on his right and left hand in his kingdom. Yet here they all were, asleep. And these were fishermen who were used to staying up all night on the lake fishing. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus says to them. The flesh is weak, weakened by the sin that lives within us. We know the good that God wants us to do, and and we even desire in our new spirit, the new man that believes in Jesus as our Savior, but so often we just can't carry out that desire to do the good. So often we fail to resist the devil's temptations. We fail to keep watch. We fail to pray. And sometimes we even play with fire. And so often we get badly burned when we do so. Well, this church year season of Lent calls us to spiritual discipline. It calls us to watch and to pray. Yet Jesus here doesn't tell us to somehow inside of our weak flesh find some kind of strength within us, some kind of resolve that we just try harder and do better. He doesn't just say, watch and pray. But he says, pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Prayer is important in the Christian's life. But here, Jesus isn't just talking about praying for the sick and 
praying for blessings and praying for and out of thanksgiving to God, which are all wonderful things for us to do. Rather, Jesus is saying that spiritual discipline is to pray for God's power and strength in the time of testing and temptation, to resist the devil's lies, and to resist sinning against God. Really, what Jesus is telling his disciples and what he is telling us is no different than what he had earlier taught his disciples to pray when he taught them what we now know as the Lord's Prayer. He taught them to pray, lead us not into temptation. This is a prayer for God's protection, for God's strength, for God's help against the daily spiritual attacks that we face, that the devil launches at us constantly, and that also the world and our own sinful nature cooperate in to lead us away from God's will into sin. On our own, by our own strength and willpower, we simply can't stand up against those attacks. We're far too weak. And it's nothing but sinful, selfish arrogance to think that we can stand up against those temptations by ourselves. But here is a prayer that certainly is powerful. It's a prayer that also closely ties in with the third petition of the Lord's Prayer where Jesus teaches us to pray to God for your will to be done. This is God's will, as Martin Luther expounds in the small catechism, to break and to frustrate every evil plan of Satan and for God to protect his believers all the way to eternal life through his powerful word that teaches us to cling in faith to Jesus, our only Savior. This is God's good and gracious will for which God directs us to pray to him and to ask him to give us this blessing. May God grant that we are faithful in doing so. As we see our Savior suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane, we are encouraged to pray for this. For we know how eager and how able our God and Father is both to hear our prayers and to answer them, to help us in the time of temptation and testing, both for his glory and for our salvation. Amen.